Okay. I'm doing it from this side because I'm going to be drawing on this board. This is the uh, story of John F. Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. All right, so set the stage here, historically speaking. The United States created an atomic bomb, and that's what we used to win World War II. We dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. They were the explosive equivalent of what they called a 20 kiloton device. It created such a huge explosion that it was the equivalent of 20,000 tons of dynamite. 20,000 tons of dynamite. Now, a single stick of dynamite weighs about a half a pound. And if we were to light off a stick of dynamite and drop it in a room that I was sitting, it would blow this room off the end of my house and probably kill me. Very inconvenient. 20,000 tons of dynamite, one bomb. It cleared about a three square mile, a three mile circle of downtown Hiroshima, virtually wiped it off the map. Now, when we built one, then in 1948, the Soviet Union, they figured out how to build an atomic bomb too. And they built it using stolen plans because they had spies in the United States. Imagine that. So, the United States starts building bigger atomic bombs, and then uh, we figured out how to build a bigger, bigger bomb called an H-bomb, and it stands for hydrogen bomb, and it, it changes the physics of how the thing actually blows up. An atomic bomb depends on what is called fission. It blows something up, uh, an a, um, element called uranium-235. Uh, an H-bomb does what's called fusion. It presses two elements together and releases a tremendous amount of energy. Fusion is what the sun uses to produce all of its energy. So an H-bomb would be measured in megatons. And the United States started building 20 megaton H-bombs, the equivalent of 20 million tons of dynamite. The largest uh, hydrogen bomb ever built by the Soviet Union 50 megaton device would leave a hole in the ground 30 miles from end to end. A hole in the ground. And the blast radius from that would be out another 30 or 40 miles. There wouldn't be a single thing standing. A 50 megaton device. Now, we build the H-bomb. The Soviets build the H-bomb in 1956. They got spies, right? And so all of a sudden, the world is divided into two halves, two superpowers, both with nuclear weapons, all right? Now, the difference was this. We had three ways to attack the Soviet Union. Now, Russia is on the other side of the world, right? And you kind of have to picture, actually I got a map, I'll show you where it is in a minute. We had three ways to get these atomic bombs over to Russia. It's not like you could put them on a truck and drive them over there, right? So the first thing we had was long range bombers called B-52. The Supreme Air Command commanded these B-52s. At any given time, there was attack airplane constantly in the air, circling just outside of Soviet airspace off the Pacific Ocean, off the Arctic Ocean, and off the coast of Alaska. When those planes started running low on fuel, another group of planes would be approaching and they would kind of switch places so that we had airplanes in the air with two 20 megaton bombs 24-7 for almost 50 years we maintained these bombers up in the up in the sky. The second way we had was missiles. And we had two types of missiles. An ICBM, which stands for Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. They carried one warhead each of 20 or 30 megatons, and they had a range of 8,000 miles. We could launch them from the United States. They could get all the way to the other side of the world and land in Russia. We also had short-range missiles at about 1,000 miles. The third th way we had was submarine launched missiles. We had uh, huge uh, submarines, they were called boomers, they carried nuclear tipped missiles, short range missiles, and they were constantly in the water off the coast of, uh, of Russia. They were always underwater, always impossible to find, they were always there, and the Russians knew it, and the Russians knew they couldn't get at them. Now, here's the problem that Russia had. We had three ways to get at Russia. They only had two. They had long-range bombers, 
they had missiles, but they hadn't perfected submarine-launched missiles yet. They wouldn't do that until the late 1960s. Now, just to kind of make it harder on Russia, uh, two countries on the southern border of Russia, the country of Turkey and the country of Iran, which were very close to the USSR's borders, we had short-range missiles there too. And the Soviet Union wanted something like that because... They wanted to be able to attack us. You see, they were convinced that the United States was going to attack the Soviet Union, and we were convinced that the Soviet Union was going to attack us. It was a standoff. So, here's, here's why this is important. Okay, now, this is a poorly drawn map of the world. Now, here you have the United States and North America with Alaska and Canada, and down here you have South America and Mexico and Cuba going to become important in a minute. On the other side of the world is the Soviet Union. This is the Asian landmass, China and India, and then uh, Japan was here, and then Africa's down here. And the North Pole is here with a polar ice cap this way. The USSR had missiles here. They had hundreds of ICBM missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, capable of reaching the United States. And we had hundreds of missiles all throughout the United States as well. We had lots of them buried in underground silos. In addition, we had our long-range bombers that were flying off the coast like this, and they wanted their own bombers, but they weren't that good. And we also had submarines underneath the ocean constantly around their coast. Now, here's the deal. If the Soviet Union launched a missile. The reason they're called ballistic missiles is that they don't travel flat. They arc their way up into space. So with a missile launch, the missile would travel up into outer space and come down on Washington, D.C. They would launch dozens, hundreds, to every major city in the United States. But you see, those missiles, they take time. Those missiles would take about 50, maybe 60 minutes from launch to land. And in 60 minutes' time, we could launch our missiles on the way back. We would send our missiles over here, and we would send our missiles up, and we would cream their capital city of Moscow the same way they were going to cream Washington, D.C. Now, the difference was we had radar installations here in Alaska, and they had their radar installations here in Siberia, so that if we were to launch, they would see it, and we would see it. And that would give us time to launch our own missiles. If they launched first, we had about an hour to live. And that's what it would be, an hour to live. I'm going to show you a film later on when we talk about President Reagan called The Day After. Not the one about the ice and the age and the glaciers, that stupid movie. But this one is actually about a Soviet attack on the United States, and it is a horribly depressing film. I'm going to show it to you anyway. Ha! So, 30 minutes for them to launch, and that would give us about, about an hour's worth of time to launch our missiles back. Because we knew that if they attacked us, we would have enough missiles left over to absolutely kill every single one of them, and they had enough missiles to kill every single one of us. And you know what this was called? M-A-D. Mutual Assured Destruction. Mutual, meaning both sides, assured, means it was going to be a sure thing, Destruction. Mutual assured destruction. They would kill all of us. We would kill all of them. We knew that we could kill all of us. They knew that we could kill all of them. They knew we knew that they knew that we knew that they knew we could kill all of them. They could kill all of us. Everyone knew everything, and that's why it never actually happened. Crazy thinking, right? Mutual assured destruction. Now, all this changed with Castro and Cuba. Here's why. With the Soviet Union launching their missiles from Russia, we would have an hour to plan and send our missiles back over there in order to destroy them. What if they had missiles in Cuba? See, this was the solution. 
Russia's solution was this, move missiles into Castro's Cuba. So you put your missiles here. Right? Because that way, these, Cuba's only 90 miles from Florida, right? And it's like in our own backyard, we're crying out loud. Those missiles would be 12 minutes to Washington, D.C. Just 13 minutes, well, 15, I don't know, to, to New York City. They could destroy our nation's capital before we could get our missiles off. That was not acceptable. And John F. Kennedy realized he had to do something, and he had to do something quick, because when the CIA told him that the Soviet Union was setting up missile launchers in Cuba, he had to act, but he didn't really know what to do. Here was his three options. Option number one, bomb Cuba and destroy it. Option number two, invade Cuba and destroy it. And you know what that would mean? Nuclear war with the, United, with the USSR. 200 million dead Americans. Not a good option. So, Kennedy, being an old Navy guy, remember he, he was a naval commander in World War II, he realizes the strength of the United States and the weakness of the Soviet Union was the Navy. And they created a naval blockade. We put our Navy in a blockade here and the Russian ships wouldn't be able to deliver the missiles. You see, they had already delivered the launching pad and all the control facilities, but they hadn't delivered the actual missiles with the actual nuclear bombs attached. They hadn't done that yet, and the CIA found out about that. So we formed a shield to block Cuba from Russian ships. Now, all this comes down in August, I'm sorry, in October of 1962. I was nine years old and I was living, my mom and dad had a house just outside of Washington, D.C. If nuclear war happened, we would be vaporized. And you know, at nine years old, you don't really understand all the politics and you don't understand all the stuff that's going on. All you know is that your mom is crying because dad had to go to work in the city of Washington and she was scared to death that the Russians would attack and her two kids, me and my sister, would be at school and her husband would be at work and she would die alone. And she was terrified of that. I remember going with my mom to the grocery store and buying, you know, buying dozens and dozens of cans of food and big jugs of water and everything else. I went with my dad to the hardware store. We got big sheets of plywood and we covered the windows of the basement of our house and we piled dirt up against it because our government lied to us and say that we could, we could survive a nuclear attack. That's why we're going to watch that film, Duck and Cover. It's just absolutely ridiculous what they did. Okay, so, personal story over. Back to this. The USSR was convinced that JFK was a weak leader because of how he screwed up the Bay of Pigs. And so that's why they put missile launchers into Cuba, guarded by Russian troops and being built by Russian technicians. If we attacked, uh, then we would kill their soldiers and it would mean war. An American attack on Cuba would mean nuclear war, and that would mean 200 million dead Americans. The U.S. Navy decides to blockade Cuba and intercept the USSR ships that were coming in, bringing more supplies, the missiles and the warheads themselves. Very tense standoff as the Soviet Navy subs began to target the U.S. carrier fleets and we knew that they were targeting it. And all it would take would one officer getting nervous and pushing a button and it would all go bad. You know that most recent X-Men movie where it shows the X-Men as, you know, like teenagers and whatnot. And there's that crazy standoff on the island with Magneto and then the other guy, right? And all the navies are out there, right? That's kind of what it was like. So, JFK and Khrushchev negotiated over the phone with translators, and of course you got to make sure your translator is doing it right, right? And the U.S. military and the USSR's military, what they called eyeball to eyeball. We're like that close, right? We're waiting for them to do something because we're going to do something back, and they're waiting for us to do something because they're going to do something back, and there's going to be worldwide nuclear war, and there's not going to be anything left. Amazingly. Khrushchev blinks. He orders the Soviet Navy to stand down, to not cross that line of blockade. 
don't risk running into an American ship. Don't risk making an American ship fire a shell at a Soviet vessel and sinking it and then everything breaks loose. Because you know what? JFK was tougher than Khrushchev thought. He thought JFK was a weenie. JFK had stronger stuff. He was a war hero. He won medals for saving his crew. And I'm telling you the truth. We came dang close to annihilation. And I'm telling you, you wouldn't have been born if this had gone the other way. None of us would be here. The world escaped nuclear destruction by just almost chance. That's the Cuban Missile Crisis. The United States came this close to total war and the end of the world as we know it. But we survived. That's John F. Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis.